Hello, everyone. This is Dennis Mosley, and I wanted to welcome you to the first episode of On Deck with Dennis Mosley. I'd like to thank uh, Empower Business Coaching for sponsoring this and putting it on. So, coming to you from our location in Clear Lake, Texas, today we will be talking with Mike Schaefer of Monarch Graphics, our Monarch Signing Graphics. Yeah. And what I wanted, what we're going to do is we're just going to have a little conversation. You know, I've been doing a little research as to some of the most requested questions that entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs get, and the ones that people really want to know about. So I have a few questions I want to talk to Mike about, but first of all, I'd like to ask Mike to give a kind of a brief introduction of his business and uh, what he likes about it. So, uh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, Monarch Signing Graphics, we are a full-service uh, signing graphic company. We start from the initial logo design to building signs, wayfinding signs, ADA signs, and vehicle wraps, uh, along with many other, many other services. Okay. So, Mike, how did you get started in that business? How I got started, it, it's a long story. I'll kind of summarize it. Uh, for, for this podcast, uh, had, had, had several options, uh, in the beginning on businesses that, that I would, uh, want to get into. Uh, some of them seemed a, a lot more fun than others. And then in the end, I wound up going out on my own and started something in the signing graphic industry. I'd always been a little bit on the creative side and thought that I could do it uh, a little bit better than some of the companies that were out there as far as customer service, quality, and integrity were concerned. Okay. So once you decided to put a business together and get it going, what did you do and how did you get it off the ground? Uh, to get it off the ground, we started with obviously, you know, a lot, a lot of market research. Uh, we looked at a lot of the similar type companies that were in our targeted market 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 uh, area, uh, decided there wasn't really a lot that were doing exactly what we were doing, where we were trying to do it, and felt like the the northern Houston side of, of town would would be the place to set up. Okay, so once you got all that together, did you decide to go into business? Just I'm going to do a sign company, and you went that way. Did you go with? a franchise what did what did you do to get into that market so on that uh we look at basically all three sides of that question uh which is the obvious the, the franchises go do what somebody else has already figured out how to do it and do it their way there's the second way which is just go all out on your own and figure it out for yourself the third way was what we what we found out was called a business opportunity, which is similar to a franchise. You still buy into it. They give you some guidelines to go by on how to form your company, but they don't really set a lot of rules on what you can or cannot do. So you've kind of got the best best of both worlds, kind of going in with a franchise, but still with the autonomy to that you're on your own to, to figure it out. Okay. So in doing that, you know, you always hear people talk about, you know, I had to get everything together, I had to put everything together, and, and then that, that term comes up, you got to spend money to make money. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Um, I think it depends on what you're spending the money on. Uh, just because you spend money doesn't mean you're going to make money. Um, there, there's lots of different equipment in our industry. If I buy the wrong piece of equipment that I'm not set up, and already marketed for that type of product that that machine is going to make for me, then I'm not really going to make money fast on that machine because now I've got to figure out how I'm going to market for that machine. I think it does hold weight if you're already in something and you're monitoring and measuring your KPIs and you're following where am I spending what money on. And when you get to a certain point where what you're paying to outsource a process, a, a process makes more sense to bring it in-house, then that's the right time to spend the money to make the more money. 
So essentially, you're already making the money. Now you're just going to make more of it because you're putting less of it out there to other companies to support you. So kind of driving off that question, when in your mind is it important to bring it in-house as opposed to have it outsourced? That has a whole lot of different avenues to, to look at. Um, obviously, there there is, you know, going off the previous question, how much money are you spending to make these products? And can you spend less to make it in-house and still deliver the same quality product? There is also a, a lot of, of market streams to take a look at. And if the market can no longer support the way you want to take care of your clients, then it might be time to look at bringing some of those processes in-house to make sure that you can still support your clients at the level that they want to be supported at to make sure that they continue to feel important. Okay. So as you go through and you're, you're, you're figuring all this stuff out, part of that is going to be staffing. And so at yeah. some point you're going to have to staff. And how do you make the determination of whether it's a part-time employee, a full-time employee, a 1099 employee, or, you know, a person that's just 100% on staff. So, and, and much like when it's time to, to make the, the decision on when it's time to bring something in-house versus out-house, um, I look at, at, at our 1099s and our part-time employees in the same way. If I need to hire somebody for, for welding for a project, it doesn't really make sense to bring somebody on on staff full time, buy all the welding equipment for a single project. So if, if it's those type of projects where it's 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 very infrequent, then my opinion is it makes a lot more sense to have this be a 1099 type of employee that only works for you occasionally when you have a type of product. If you need to to have the higher level of control over when and where that employee is going to be. Then, then definitely a, a W two employee is the way to is the way to go because there are a lot of laws and regulations that cover how you can, can and cannot classify a 1099 employee. So in, in the end, the ultimate question is for your tax advisor, it's for your CPA. But that's kind of how we look at when we should pose that question to those people. Uh, along with that staffing question, you know, you being as a service that people provide, how do you find the staff that you're looking for? Job boards. Job boards are our main way to get to, to get it. Uh, we've tried a lot of them. Some of them do work better than others. Um, some of them, I mean, you can kind of look at the quality of employee that you get based on what your your investment is in the in that particular platform. So some of the online platforms might be 20 bucks a month. You're going to get uh, somebody on level with a $20 a month employee. Others are 1000 to $2,000 a month. There's some others that we found that work much better that have more of an annual fee. So it doesn't matter how many jobs we post for our location. It's one month, one fee for the entire year. And that's, that's pretty much where we have found our, our best results. Uh, obviously, when we, when we do bring a new hire on, if we have additional positions to fill, we inquire with them as well. Do they got any friends in the industry that are, that are looking for a better opportunity than where they're at now? So, I know a little bit about your business, and I know that you're a veteran managed business. Yes. Um, what does that bring to the table when, when someone's out there looking for a sign company? Um, I, th I think it definitely brings some value, you know, having served our country and portraying our, our company as, you know, we are we are a veteran-led uh, company, and to, to some companies that does mean something, and and it does get our, our foot in the door, so to speak, uh, where we might not have had that opportunity without the veteran-owned or the, the woman-owned uh, uh, identifier. Okay. So... As you're doing this, for that person out there who's thinking, you know, being an entrepreneur is what I want to do, um, what kind of advice would you have for a budding entrepreneur out there? Ooh, that's a good one. 
Uh, I wish I could actually have that to, to, to do over again sometime, someday. I would definitely say make sure that whatever you're getting into, you are passionate about it. If you are not passionate about it, the, the, the hard days could probably be too much to keep going. Uh, but if you've got that right level of passion for what you're doing, you can essentially muscle through the bad days, the bad times, the tough times to get through to the end goal that you're trying to, to get to, which is a fully sustainable business. But it is, it is, it is by far not an easy course. So without the passion, the, the course can't be continued. So I've started, I've started my business. I figured out what it is. I've got staff. How do you keep a steady clientele? Uh, marketing uh, is obviously one. Um, it is one of the one of the areas where you know you do have to spend money to make money, and it's a it's a, it, it can be a tough pill to swallow because it's not always it's not always cheap, and it's not always accurate. So you you basically throw a lot of darts out there, hope that you hit the board. And when you do find something that's hitting the board, you just keep targeting for that exact same result. So you're looking for that targeted marketing to get you the result that you're looking Exactly. Well, I know that you have worked with various coaching situations and things. How important is it for an entrepreneur to look for help? I think it's extremely important. Um, I have, I've been trained as a coach. I've been a coach. Uh, I've been a manager and now I'm a business owner. Uh, all of the training that I had as a coach back when I was in corporate America doesn't really seem to translate to coaching myself, which has been a, which has been a, a, a tough obstacle trying to keep my own self on point, uh, while I'm still trying to keep all of these other little fishes swimming in the same direction, uh, I've got to keep myself going the same direction as well. And it hasn't always been a, an easy task. Uh, we have we've tried other coaching programs. Um, they're, they're not all created equal. Um, for us, it kind of turned us off on it for a little while. I had to go back to, to some of what I've been taught before in corporate America to get back into, they're, they're not all created equal. Um, I mean, a lot of it you can you can take to a sports team. You can have the force, best sports team in the world with a good coach, and you put a poor coach in with them, and you can almost watch them just fall off the leaderboard. I see that a lot. So to wrap up, I know you and your wife run this business together. Mm -hmm. How important, and you know, what's it like to be in business? With a spouse, uh, that's a that's a tough road. There, there's no doubt about it. You're with somebody. You're with them 24/7 a day. Most relationships, they get a break when you go to work. Um, when you go into business with your spouse, you're with them at work. You're with them off work, and it gets to be very difficult to to draw the lines on when you're going to be on work, when you're not going to be on work. What issues from work? Are going to come to the house, and how do you how do you drive that wedge so where that work stays work and home stays home? Uh, it's it, it is difficult, and it's it's there's not really any firm guidance on how to deal with that. So you kind of got to figure it out on your own. It took us a few years to figure out how to put those two things together that had always existed apart perfectly. But then you're trying to bring them together. Um, it's a it's a, it's a tough road. It, it leads to a lot of arguments. Uh, do you figure out how to make it work? Well, I know in doing some talking with you and when we're researching the business, your the name Monarch doesn't just mean the bottom butterfly. No, it does not. So, um, you know, kind of to wrap this up. Tell us a little bit about what Monarch means. And why do you think that's helped you stand apart from the people, other people in your in your industry? So when we first started, I mean, obviously the first thing I want to after, after you figure out what you want to do, the next thing is what are we going to be called? 
and we just started writing down every name that we that we could think of. One of my wife's big things is she wanted it to be something intrinsic to Texas, but not quite as cliche as a lot of the other more common names. You know, your Lone Stars, your Alamos, San Jacinto, Tejas, all of that, that is just, it, it's way oversaturated. She knew that the monarch butterfly had a major migratory path through the state of Texas. So out of all of our names, that was one that really stuck out to us because it was a big part of Texas. What we didn't find out until later is that the monarch butterfly is actually the state insect of Texas. So not only did it, did it name something that was part of Texas, it named something that is Texas. We took it a step further and created an acrostic for it based on, you know, based loosely on the migratory path of the monarch butterfly, making our name accountable for reliability of service, customer satisfaction, and honoring commitment. When you take that acrostic, it spells monarch and it stands for everything that we believe in. Uh, we've been in business eight and a half years now. To this date, we have not lived up to what our acrostic means. So it's every day is a constant battle to make that. Every day is, a, it, it, it is. Every day is a constant battle to make it right and keep everybody happy. Well, I want to thank you, Mike, for coming out to the shooting location and taking the time to kind of do this interview. This is the first of many for us. And I want to thank you. I want to thank your wife for giving us the time to do this. Uh, and I want to thank everyone that has tuned in to take a look at this. Um, as you want, as we go on week by week, there'll be a new person that a new entrepreneur that's here. If you have any questions that you would like answered by an entrepreneur, please feel free to write in uh, to our email address, which will be listed on the bottom of the screen, and we will endeavor to find an entrepreneur that can address that question and help you with your business. With that, thank you for watching, and that's going to be it for us today. Thanks.